time and place for our informational meeting with Cyan H2. Commissioner Buchek, Bukacek and myself are in attendance in the room. Uh, is Vice President Fielder online with us? If she joins, uh, please let me know. Uh, and uh, same goes for uh, President Jim Brown. Uh, Commissioner uh, Tony O'Donnell is out of town, so he's excused. Um, do we have uh, some representatives online that are panelists, Philip? Is this an opportunity to introduce ourselves? Hi, this is Mike Breen, uh, panelist with Scion H2. Thank you. Good to have you. And Great to other, be here. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you very much. Our other guest? Uh, this is Cannon Lurkins. I'm the Industry Development Manager for the Montana Department of Commerce. Okay. Um, this meeting will be recorded. Uh, it'll be available on YouTube uh, for anyone to email to anyone. Um, I want to thank um, Cyan H2 for being here. Montana does not produce enough energy to supply uh, the needs of the state. Many times when we go out of state to bring energy in, we have to pay 10 times or more for that energy than when we produce it in state. Um, so I'm welcoming any industry who uh, has some answers for baseload energy. Uh, it is my belief that if Montana produced more energy than it needed, we could see prices come down. Um, I believe Montana could be an energy exporter instead of an energy importer. Um, I believe this makes it healthier for Montana and makes us more secure. The Western United States um, is concerned about shortages. We've had controlled brownouts. A controlled brownout, of course, is when we simply ask for energy and it's not available and we have to turn the power off somewhere. This has happened in California and Oregon and other states. And uh, uh, Representative Jerry Scherlinger says it's happened in Circle, Montana. So um, I'm hoping that uh, some people may fall in in attendance as the meeting proceeds. Uh, Philip, just kind of raise your hand and let me know. Um, I'm just hoping for Representative Greg Kometz uh, to join us today. He had scheduled, so we'll join in. And uh, is it true I see a, a third person uh, now online, Philip? Dylan, could you introduce yourself? Can you hear us okay? You have to unmute your mic, Dylan. And I see Greg Kometz is online. Greg, can you hear us? Representative Greg Kmet. Well, if a panelist has any question, uh, raise your hand. Sometimes I'm not paying attention to the screen. I'm focused on the speaker. So somebody flag me if you see a hand raised. And uh, you guys introduce yourselves whenever uh, you feel that you can by just raising your hand. And any questions, sure, let me know at any time. Um, gentlemen. Tell me about your company and what the plan is. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for allowing us the opportunity to come and present to you. We appreciate the opportunity for that. Is it better? There we go. Uh, that's important so that we have a good recording on yeah. YouTube. If yeah. you speak and you're not into the mic and the blue light's not on, they won't hear it on YouTube. So. I encourage you to speak clearly and right into the mic so we have a good recording to email others. Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for letting us be here. Uh, we do, we're excited to show you what we've been working on. And, and uh, we've got a, a nice slide deck here to go through with you. We'd like to present that to you and uh, we'll go through that and then answer any questions you have on that. Okay, so Cyan, we're here to talk to you about an Eastern Montana hydrogen project we're working on, uh, focusing on American-made, Montana-made uh, hydrogen and hydrogen derivative products, uh, focusing on rural talent, uh, also transitioning coal communities. There, there's several communities that this would impact that uh, are struggling right now because of the, uh, what's happening with the coal. And it's a focus on low carbon, 
low cost products. So. So this just a again this I want to just make a, a disclaimer here. This is just a high level presentation. It does not represent H twos uh, assign H twos detailed investment or engineering plans. Um, just so we're all familiar with what's going on there. So assign we're we're a group of highly educated individuals making up the company here um, with the likes of education through uh, Annapolis U.S. Naval Academy, uh, West Point. Uh, we have even have one member who has a really elite education through Montana State University. I'm not going to point out who he is, but it's me. Uh, <laughs> and we also have, uh, uh, each of us bring our own unique and diverse set of skills to the team uh, from the likes of financing of uh, financing and um, investment with Goldman Sachs, uh, data analysis management consultants through uh, Microsoft. Uh, we got uh, nuclear engineers, um, production engineers for um, petroleum, and also have done some advising with Honda uh, and GM on the H2 fuel cell programs that they're using. And also um, a significant background in uh, industrial, heavy industrial uh, ag processing facilities and uh, some project development and success with baseload energy projects. So as we as we talk about hydrogen, there there's a just a, a hydrogen market globally. There's a big opportunity for hydrogen, and so if we look at this on the left side, we have uh, power generation, transportation, industry, um, building heat and power, etc. And this is over like the next fifty, well, till twenty fifty. Uh, and as you look at the size of the bubble, that kind of indicates the the biggest opportunity uh, for the impact of hydrogen, and when it comes to reduction of um, carbon. And so on the, on the zero, that's kind of your low hanging fruit um, that you can have the biggest impact quickly with. And then over the next to 2050, you can see the impacts that we could have as we move forward with each of those industries. And if I can add on this, the, the producer of this chart is McKinsey. So they're arguably the world's top management consulting firm. Um, what they are predicting is that in 2050, if you look at this chart and you do a weighted average of all of the uh, assigned uh, allotment of hydrogen to a given industry, that they are making the prediction that over 20% of the world's energy portfolio will be hydrogen. That's hugely important because today hydrogen is a very small industry. And what we're telling everyone through this presentation is that Montana is an incredible place for low cost, low carbon, high volume hydrogen production. We believe it's one of the best places in North America in the interior. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the U.S. and many other nations are already trying to develop some kind of a footprint for supporting a hydrogen industry. Uh, the United States, we've got the Department of Energy has put out a uh, kind of a framework for trying to support getting uh, hydrogen hubs built in the United States. And they actually had a process where they've gone through and, and uh, accepted letters of concept for how, how somebody may, or some company may want to do hydrogen. Uh, and I don't know, I can remember, they had like 35 of them or something like that. I can't remember. They submitted back in uh, November of 20. Uh, 2022. Uh, and of those, about 18 of them here have been given kind of notice or letters of encouragement to proceed with their ideas uh, to maybe help develop uh, a hub in their area. And this is just an example of that, but it, it kind of shows that as a nation and probably as, as a world, people are realizing that hydrogen is probably going to be part of the future as, as we try to look and clean up the um, carbon emissions that we've got going. Here's an example of what's going on in China. I think we, they've got 53 announced projects there across China for hydrogen, uh, everything from uh, transportation to energy. Uh, across there, so. So 
th this chart kind of encompasses uh, what can happen with hydrogen and, and also its co-products. So if you look at the, uh, it says supplanting natural gas up there, that, that's a map of the existing natural gas lines and transmission through uh, the United States. Uh, and actually you, you could today implement a percentage of hydrogen into those lines and not have any impact on the equipment that's using those other than lowering emissions for the equipment that actually uses it. So that, that's one opportunity. And then maybe in the future, even uh, going to a higher percentage of hydrogen as, as equipment adapts to it. Uh, fertilizer is, is a good coal product that helps us to um, reduce the carbon footprint of the hydrogens being produced through blue hydrogen usage. And that's being done through uh, uh, enhanced oil recovery or uh, sequestration. It can be used directly for uh, power generation, and on the when it says H2 fueling stations there, there's already a network being developed within California to provide fueling stations for hydrogen for their semi-trucks down there for transportation and moving a freight down there. So it, it's already happening in different areas. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so back to that 20% of, of the world's portfolio is estimated is going to be hydrogen. Is that blue, green, pink, brown, gray? You know, is, it, is that percentage, that 20% broken down to the different kinds of hydrogen? Ma'am, it's a great question. Um, that would be low carbon hydrogen as opposed to, say, present day hydrogen, which is high carbon. Um, that so it is, could be pink, green, or blue. Exactly. Basically. It, okay. Exactly. It could be green. It could be blue. Um, and and there are different opinions. Um, different investment banks have different projections. Different consultancies have different projections. But the common denominator is everyone believes that there is going to be a step change increase in low carbon hydrogen. And and just as you're, um, uh, you know suggesting it can be achieved all sorts of different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be green hydrogen. But is it, is it, do they break down that 20% into pink, green, and blue? Do they, you said there are different estimates. Sure. And, and we That's have important. It, it is. And really it boils down to cost of production. Uh, what is your low cost of production method of low carbon hydrogen? And we have a slide that gets into that. And, and uh, so you, you can see um, where, for instance, blue hydrogen, uh, natural gas based or blue hydrogen, uh, even coal based or blue hydrogen, um, what, what they call low carbon electricity based um, and, and, and see how that kind of stacks out. Um, I, I would say that the low carbon electricity based, um, that pink hydrogen is probably bundled into that um, since, since that's how it would be defined. But um, as far as a disaggregation of low carbon uh, electrical um, basis of low carbon hydrogen, um, I don't know if it's out there yet. It, it really just kind of depends on what the nuclear footprint would be. I have a couple of places I'd like to start. For first time listeners, we may, you know, I plan to send this video out to a few thousand people right off the bat. Um, some people are still learning about hydrogen. And I think a good place to start is if we take electricity and put in two electrodes, a positive and negative, into water, gas bubbles surface to the water. Some of them are oxygen, some are nitrogen, some are hydrogen. Hydrogen. Uh, when collected, uh, burns like gas, like, uh, say, natural gas. It's a fuel. Uh, does this sound correct, gentlemen? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, a kilogram of hydrogen actually has more energy um, than a kilogram of natural gas or uh, CH4 methane. Um, it, and, and there are trade-offs to both, but um, one kilogram of hydrogen will usually yield about 33 and a third uh, kilowatt hours of, of energy um, potential. So um, absolutely, hydrogen is a, a fuel in and of itself. It can also be a store of energy. Um, and so it, there's a lot of versatility. And, and the one thing about hydrogen is it comprises 70% of the universe's mass. So it's very available um, it, it's bundled into most 
um, things we that are around us. And, and over time, there'll be more and more technology and more and more innovation unlocking that in a responsible manner for, for, for use um, in power, transportation, and uh, low-carbon hydrogen-derived products. So for my listeners who have never heard uh, about hydrogen or how it's made or where it comes from, it's important we cover this. Would you guys agree that hydrogen is the number one fuel source available on the planet Earth? Given the fact that hydrogen is 70% of the universe's mass, given the fact that our planet is primarily water, which is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, I would say that's very true. Um, it, but like with all energy sources, there are trade-offs, there are pros and cons, but hydrogen as most people are sort of coming around to is definitely going to be an instrumental part of our energy portfolio. And, and back to um, the commissioner's question about the 20% of, uh, of global energy that's in 2050. So what, what will it be in 2150 for our, our grandkids and, and their grandkids? Um, it, my guess is, Things will probably increasingly skew to um, to, to to hydrogen. Um, it perhaps as a complementary piece of other energy um, production means. Also, an important point that was brought up is that we can mix this in natural gas, and the percentage I believe that we can mix into natural gas without anyone knowing any difference when they heat their home or make hot water. Um, is up to 20% hydrogen, and we can mix that with natural gas. Does that sound correct? In in various um, use cases, yes, that is correct. Um, hydrogen, however, will be 30% to 100% of the gas mix of certain power generation facilities. Um, for instance, a very prominent power generation facility in Utah will start off at 30% hydrogen, 70% natural gas, and ultimately will become 100% hydrogen. I toured the natural gas facility that has a distribution center for the big island of, say, Hawaii, and they're mixing 20% hydrogen in their natural gas, and they call it a synthetic natural gas. And they say the homeowner is unaware uh, that it's happening, and they see no performance difference uh, and that they could actually modify uh, the appliances to work on 100% um, hydrogen, and that can be done in the future. Now, the reason this is important for the listener is that you have to understand that natural gas market is very volatile. During the wintertime, prices can double and triple. During that time, if we get proficient in taking the gas out of water, uh, it could compete or maybe lower the cost of natural gas because as anything we've learned in the United States, once we start doing production, it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Right now, hydrogen uh, can be expensive to make, but as we improve the process and get better at it, one thing that history has taught us is uh, maybe one day extracting the fuel from water is going to be cheaper than uh, making gasoline. <laughs> well, you know, you, you don't have to drill wells for it go through a, a process of a refinery and then shipping. Now, the other thing that's important here is fertilizer. The number one product in Montana is ag. And fertilizer is a tremendous aspect to that cost. And farmers will say that fertilizer is costing more than seed. It's one of the highest costs to crops today. If we're able to make fertilizer in Montana. One of the large costs is shipping. And most of our fertilizer is shipped not only from outside of Montana, but outside the country. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yeah, it is. Yeah, we have a, a, a good portion comes down from Canada, uh, but there is still a, a large portion to come over from, uh, you know, the, the Russian Ukraine area where there's a lot of turmoil going on over there, which will have impact on volume and pricing. But yeah, we, we import a significant amount of uh, every year. And, and just just to build on that, uh, China and India uh, routinely do what they call temporary export bans. Th this is actually something that is illegal, but because they call it a temporary export ban, um, they've been so far able to get away with it. 
Um, but that does in raise the global cost of fertilizer, including for Montana farmers. And as we know, Montana farmers were paying north of $900 a ton for uh, for urea um, just a couple of years ago. Right now, they're still paying north of $600. Um, the, so this would this hydrogen pro, uh, plant that we are proposing would be Montana based, low carbon, and it would be producing fertilizer as well as hydrogen for transportation power generation. So um, anything that increases supply, anything that is Montana and USA made, um, I it would be very positive for Montana farmers and and the general ag community. Well, I'm pretty sure the farming community, um, like the Grain Growers Association, um, the question is, do you feel that you'll be able to produce fertilizer cheaper than bringing it in from outside of Montana, giving Montana farmers an advantage in lower costs? We do. Um, the, the, and, and when you also, if you, it, yes, is the answer. And then if you also consider the fact that much of this fertilizer is coming in, say, from the Middle East, um, Russia, places like that, it, it's quite an expensive process to bring that uh, to you to the United States, uh, as well as to rail it uh, across country to the Northern Plains, including Montana. Um, and, and the other thing is, in terms of carbon intensity, um, one needs to look at this from a life cycle basis. And a transocean ship that brings fertilizer halfway across the planet, uh, that is inherently going to be much more carbon intensive. And then, you know, we, price is the most important thing. Um, so yes, this would compete competitively on price, but being low carbon is also important because farmers rely on fertile um, fields and and we, we don't want to have something that uh, exacerbates any sort of drought conditions. Well, in fact, by producing this in Montana, not only are we creating jobs, we strengthen the U.S. dollar by not sending our dollars out of the country. Do you agree? That's a macroeconomic question. We we're, we're, um, have to think about it, but, um, you know, uh, possibly, I'm not sure. Well, I believe so. And Commissioner Panucci and I are both fairly passionate about these things, and uh, so I hope you have all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, we're... we're we're actually pretty honored to be here um, and, and appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. We think it's very important for Montana. We think it's very important for Montana's ag community. We think it's um, very important for Montana's energy communities, um, in, in, in co including coal strip and including Billings. I just have one one question. I, I don't know that you can answer it, but but you know the, the business of mixing ethanol with our gasoline. I mean, many of the studies have shown that it's not as efficient. It actually ends up costing the the consumer a lot more, and it's less efficient. So this could go the, the same way, mixing gas. So it remains to be seen. Um, yes, I would say so. Um, I mean, time will tell. I, I think there are some fundamental differences there. Um, it, you know, performance is one thing as well, and how, how it impacts engines and that sort of thing. A lot of the hydrogen um, would be for agricultural purposes. Um, rather than say being put into a diesel or or gasoline uh, propelled engine, um, the the other thing is that uh, you know a lot of our uh, appliances, um, but the just the way they're configured, whether it be furnaces or what have you, this is something different again from a gasoline or diesel type engine, um, and and there are today uh, turbines that. Uh, gas-fired turbines that work perfectly with hydrogen. Uh, they, they need to be constructed slightly differently than for a natural gas-only type turbine. But um, And then lastly, a lot of hydrogen is used through fuel cells. And, and you know, hydrogen is the perfect uh, feedstock for, for a proton exchange membrane fuel cell, for instance. And so um, I, I would say there's some key differences, but you're right, uh, you know, data... It, needs to be followed over time remains to be remains to be seen what what percentage will be for agricultural uses do you estimate well so um for our particular plant or just uh, generally yours and in general for for our particular plant we are going to be uh 
the base case is diverting uh, approximately 40% of our hydrogen to um, uh, agricultural fertilizer. So we're looking at approximately 43,000 tons per year of hydrogen being diverted to fertilizer. And then the balance of that would be for other things, including baseload power um, and potentially mobility or transportation. While we're talking about blue hydrogen, let's talk about the proposed turbine natural gas plant in Laurel, Montana. Now, for the listeners who are kind of wondering what a turbine is, it's very similar to a jet engine on an airplane. Oddly enough, we use a turbine in the M1 Abrams tank. One of the beauties of that is you can use gasoline or diesel or jet fuel. But when we construct the Laurel plant, when I say we... Uh, Public Service Commission working with Northwestern Energy, it would be important for them to consider putting a turbine in that could use dual fuel, for instance, hydrogen or natural gas. That upfront cost may be very little if they consider putting it in and designing it that way as they build it. If they were to build the plant and the turbines just to run on natural gas and then later wanted to modify to use hydrogen that could be a, a great deal of expense that could be avoided if it was designed that way. Uh, I want the listeners to understand this is important because if they decide to make that change, the rate payer could wind up paying for it in a higher rate. If I could avoid that cost, I'm looking out for the rate payer. Now, uh, it's, it's possible that they may uh, think that's a great idea if we could extend that idea out to them now. Uh, how do you guys feel about this? Is this good thinking, good planning? What are your thoughts? So basically, um, well, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, frankly, I think the Yellowstone Generating Station is a great idea. Um, ideally, it should follow along the lines of <clears throat> the Intermountain Power Plant in Utah, where they're going to start off with 30% hydrogen, 70% natural gas, watch the data, and then potentially reach up to 100% hydrogen. Um, this is also really important because May 11th, the EPA just released a report um, where it is strongly indicating that um, the integrating hydrogen into gas-fired power plants um, will, will be sort of the go-forward expectation. And then, you know, either that or look at renewable energy sources. We think hydrogen is a great idea because it's baseload. It's politically bipartisan. Yes, uh, it can be produced with wind and solar, but it also can be produced through hydrocarbons and, and carbon capture and sequestration. So um, we think it's definitely something that uh, Northwestern should consider strongly. Sometimes we have too much energy. All the wind turbines are turning, all the solar panels are on. We start closing off the dams so we can store up the water kind of like a battery. We ramp down coal production because we have too much electricity. Some days we can't even give it away. Would you agree that when we have too much electricity and we can't give it away, that would be a great time to use that power to make hydrogen? I do, with one caveat. Um, if if there is demand uh, that would allow that hydrogen to be used, and or if there are storage opportunities for hydrogen. Well, um, I want to turn to Greg Kometz. Uh, he may have some questions, or anyone who may be uh, online that wasn't earlier. Uh, Greg, can you hear us? And do you have some questions for us? Greg, are you still muted? Okay. Greg, we just can't hear you. Um, if you can, you could uh, maybe call in and get some assistance. I'd sure like to hear from Representative Kometz. Uh, if there's anyone that has any questions, please um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, well, that 
is the questions I have for blue hydrogen. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I wanted to hit some of those important questions. Okay, proceed with your the questions you asked. Bert raised some questions. All right, <laughs> it's gonna be a nightmare for you all. But, but anyway, um, back to the EPA. I have I have some articles here. There was there was one. This was in the um, Casper Star Tribune, May fourth. It says first carbon capture project breaks ground at Wyoming test site, and of course. Carbon capture is a is a part of the blue hydrogen because you're using natural gas and then you to call it blue hydrogen, you have to use carbon capture and sequestration. OK, so this article, May 4th, optimistic, yay, May 13th, nine days later, same newspaper, same same author as feds as feds push emission cuts to talk about the EPA, Wyoming waivers on carbon capture. And some of the quotes from this article, they're talking about um you know, because carbon capture and attempts at that go back at least till I think it's 1989 when MIT started their project. I mean, they've been working on this for decades and it doesn't seem like it's going very well. And so, you know, it makes comments like um, looking at these failures. We ask, why would the administration choose this costly and unproven technology to curb carbon pollution? They're talking about carbon sequestration. And so it, it's not as though, you know, it's not. Carbon capture and sequestration, those attempts are not new, and they've really failed. They've been very, very expensive. You know, and even, even hydrogen, the history of, of uh, hydrogen goes back to, I mean, electrolysis was discovered in 1800, and the, and the hydrogen cell was first discovered in like 18, or developed in 1838. So a lot of this, it goes way back. And I, I think about, you know, my, my 95-year-old father, who 50 years ago, he was working on a project to, to harvest power energy from algae. That was 50 years ago. And then, you know, millions of dollars, billions of dollars become available, and they're revamping algae. Um, same thing with, with sodium ion batteries. Over 50 years, they've been working on that, never got it to work. Then a lot of money becomes available, and all of a sudden, they're back looking at sodium ion. And so as far as carbon capture, working on it for decades... Hydrogen, trying to harvest energy from hydrogen has been going on for dec decades, hundreds of years, actually, uh, with some limited use. But um, so the EPA didn't necessarily help matters as far as your, your, what you're proposing. Well, I'd like to break that down a little bit, if I may. Um, electrolysis has been around a lot. It's, it's used effectively um, in all sorts of capacities, and there's not a single study that I've ever seen that says electrolysis that produces hydrogen is a bad idea. So I, I just want to make sure that we don't conflate electrolysis. Correct. My with... point is just that it's not new. The stuff is not new. That's, my, that's kind of my focus is all the things that have been tried for decades. Sure, but sometimes technologies are favored, not necessarily because they're better, but because of certain dynamics in the economy and politics and whatnot. Now we're looking at how do we create good baseload, reliable, um, low carbon um, energy for the United States and, and, and for the globe. So, um, so but, but point taken, uh, uh, electrolysis was used on the nuclear submarine where I was a nuclear engineer on. So 100% it's, it's used and it's been used. About, about carbon capture, I, there are two types of carbon capture. One is not a very useful type of carbon capture. And I think that's the one you're referring to that's been around for a long time. Um, that would be called post-combustion carbon capture. So a lot of folks, when they're looking at carbon capture from a post-combustion standpoint, have a very good point. This doesn't work. I would 100% agree with you. If you were to categorize carbon capture in the context of post-combustion carbon capture, I would say this is something that's been tried and let's, let's move on. Um, what we are proposing is pre-combustion carbon capture, completely different animal. And it revolves, it, it involves um, capturing carbon um, in a state where the system doesn't have to be as big, doesn't have to be as costly, and it's far more efficient. So completely two different categories of carbon capture. Um, and, and it's important not to conflate the old post-carbon capture, post-combustion carbon capture with what we are suggesting, which is pre-combustion carbon capture. 
completely different situation. Is the pre-combustion carbon capture tried and true? Yes, yes, it is. What can you give some examples um, of of pre-combustion carbon capture? It's tried and true. Sure. Um, there's a huge plant in Australia right now, as we speak, that is pre-combustion carbon capture. Any sort of gasification, any sort of steam methane reformation with pre-combustion carbon capture falls under that category. So the United States is lagging behind, but just because it's not happening in the United States doesn't mean it's not happening. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, so we just got a couple more examples here of what, what's happening with hydrogen. Uh, we got one, uh, the one transocean shipping there, that was putting hydrogen in ammonia form. And actually, when was that shipped? Like last November, whenever that transocean shipment of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So it, it's happening there. Uh, there's been uh, flights, uh, small regional flights on hydrogen uh, demonstrated. We really talked about merchant power availability with uh, providing baseload energy with hydrogen. Uh, rail, again, ammonia refineries and ag equipment as well being driven by hydrogen. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you can, this is a plane. So just to set this up, this is an example of hydrogen uh, fuel cells driving um, uh, an airplane. And, and this just happened in March of 2023. These are expected to be carrying passengers in the United States in 2025. So this is happening. I understand Airbus is working on a, an aircraft right now that'll burn on hydrogen. It'll be, um, and they're encouraging airports maybe to uh, be able to fuel hydrogen. And they're going to start with flights between certain cities where um, the hydrogen plane will fly between point A and point B, and then they'll expand out from there. Does this sound like that's what they're talking about? Yes, not just Airbus, which is you know one of the two biggest airplane manufacturers in the world, um, Boeing and Airbus, but but also um, operators like Alaska Airlines, um, startups like Universal Hydrogen. It, it's it's happening. It it just makes a lot of economic sense in a lot of ways. But we have a video that uh, that shows this um, transformative flight using hydrogen fuel cells that just happened. This is the largest airplane ever to fly on hydrogen fuel cells. It's a flight test platform for the first ever commercial plane to run on sunshine and emit nothing but water. You'll be able to take a hydrogen regional flight on a plane like this one as early as 2025 using a fuel cell electric engine in place of the conventional kerosene burning one for a safer, more affordable and guilt-free flying experience. We bring green hydrogen to airports and directly into the airplane using modular capsules, which can be transported using existing freight infrastructure. So most airports in the world are hydrogen ready. This fueling approach works for larger airplanes also, which could be flying with hydrogen burning jet engines by the mid 2030s. In fact, they have to be, or else start reducing traffic volumes to meet global emissions targets. There just isn't another choice. For me, it was really important to get the technology in flight as soon as possible and start to expose it to the challenges that it's going to see in real life. We have a brilliant team working on this project. In one year, we've gone from a standard Dash A300 to by far the largest aircraft ever to be flown with hydrogen fuel cells. What's motivating is proving that we can fly something which most people have told us is impossible. It's always a challenge to do things that everybody tells you can't be done. How to kill all mosquitoes.
So that was green hydrogen. So completely from solar and wind. So they said green. They, they did say green. Um, yeah, and I think that's for marketing purposes. But what they're talking is low carbon hydrogen. At the end of the day, there's a carbon intensity uh, related to hydrogen. And if you can get your carbon intensity to X, it doesn't matter what the process is. So um, our process would meet that sort of carbon intensity threshold. Thank you. But I th but when it comes to, from what I've read, at least, you know, making hydrogen from electrolysis, from, from solar and wind, it's ex it requires vast amounts of power from those sources. And it's extremely ineffe inefficient and extremely expensive. And so expense matters, cost matters too. Well, that's not our plant. Um, we're, we're we're mainly focused on blue hydrogen as opposed to green hydrogen. I would agree that current cost of production using electrolysis, using solar and wind is significantly higher than other ways. Um, but we have a slide coming up that shows cost of production over time, and that cost of production will come down. But I believe that 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 just underscores the importance of blue hydrogen. Um, let's keep our carbon low. It's okay to use hydrocarbons let's not vilify hydrocarbons just because um you know it it may be um popular sometimes um because hydrocarbons have a role in this a very important role but if we have a means of efficiently making it low carbon let's do that too so was this flight 100 percent hydrogen fueled yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma uh, uh, the the fuel cell type is proton exchange membrane So again, this isn't just a startup in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is a May 1st, 2023 article uh, stating that Alaska Airlines and a partner are developing the world's largest zero emissions aircraft, and it is hydrogen. Um, so Cyan H2's low carbon hydrogen plant based in eastern Montana would power all sorts of different things. It would make fertilizer for Montana farmers and ranchers. It would also power long haul trucks, airplanes, and municipality bus fleets when those fleets need to be replaced. Um, and it would also generate low carbon utility scale baseload electricity. Ma'am, this is the cost of production uh, chart that I wanted to um, uh, bring to the commission's attention. Um, it shows on the X axis, the horizontal axis, um, different cost of production. The y-axis is dollar per kilogram. And going left to right, it says natural gas, this is without carbon capture, um, is, is the cheapest. Um, next is natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration. Next is coal and coal with carbon capture and with sequestration. Um, and just like you said before, solar and wind and, and nuclear type um, low carbon electricity based hydrogen production is by far and away the highest uh, cost of production. But there's a split in the chart that moves it decades into the future where the cost of low carbon electricity based hydrogen production would come down. But we also need a solution near term and medium term. And that's why um, we are um, focused on natural gas with carbon capture. So our proposal is the development of a $1.9 billion climate-friendly hydrogen production plant in northeastern Montana of by and for Montanans, solving three big challenges. The dearth of good eastern Montana jobs. As we know, Sydney Sugars is closed. Lewis and Clark Power Station is closed. Savage Mine is closed. A few years back, Units 1 and 2 at Coal Strip closed. There's been drought impacting farmers and ranchers. There have been a number of Bakken oil and gas projects that have been canceled. So folks are looking for not just jobs, but good jobs. And this would really help out. Um, so the dearth of good Eastern Montana jobs, this also can provide a backup solution to Coal Strip just to provide additional security to the workers in Coal Strip. And it would assist in Billings competitiveness in a post-oil era. The plant would 
complement rather than compete with the U.S. Department of Energy's hydrogen hubs. The plant would manufacture low-carbon USA-made agricultural fertilizer, benefiting national security. And let me just repeat that, benefiting national security. Fertilizer is no different than energy because energy makes fertilizer. And we need to have homegrown, low-carbon fertilizer production. So as mentioned before, significant fertilizer is currently imported from autocratic Russia in the Middle East. China and India, large fertilizer producers invoke harmful temporary export bans. All of this raises the cost of fertilizer for Montana farmers. Some farmers right now can't even afford fertilizer, and therefore their crop yields are, are lower than they'd like them to be. The plant would also provide fuel for baseload hydrogen power generation, and as opportunities arise, growing H2 mobility or transportation demand. Um, the project is an outstanding investment for people bullish on hydrogen, but who also want the plant to do other things as a hedge. Next. So common important questions about Cyan H2's low carbon hydrogen project in Eastern Montana. Um, We've talked about a lot of this, but just to kind of go over, will the project use any hydrocarbons? Yes. Will the project run any extended pipelines? Yes. And I think that's important given the cancellation of Keystone XL pipeline. These will have extended pipelines, creating a lot of jobs. Will the project generate baseload power? Yes. Will the project use carbon capture and pre-combustion carbon capture? And, and and we'll, we'll update the slides for that. Yes. Will the project require any drilling? Yes. As a backup, we will be looking at first party sequestration, which will require class six wells. Will the project create hundreds of construction and post construction jobs? We added post construction jobs because a lot of wind and solar farms produce jobs, but then those jobs go away as soon as they're operational. These would provide post-construction jobs indefinitely. Will the project be located near recent Eastern Montana plant closures and job losses, including Sydney Sugars, Savage Mine, Lewis and Clark Power Plant, Coal Strips 1 and 2, and cancellation of Keystone XL Pipeline and Bakken Oil and Gas Projects helping the economy? Yes. So what are some of our project achievements to date? We've secured a tentative agreement with a large company for the offtake or the purchase of all hydrogen derived products. Have offtake for 70% of the low carbon hydrogen produced while progressing on the remaining 30%. We've negotiated terms of purchase of 600 contiguous acres in Northeast Montana for a plant site while evaluating other potential backup sites if that location does not get finalized. Negotiating offtake term sheets for CO2, as well as mentioned, looking at first party sequestration. We've secured tentatively up to $250 million for specific plant infrastructure. We've secured needed feedstock supply for blue hydrogen. We've secured a brokerage deal for tax credits, 45 QV investment tax credit with large commodities trader. We've negotiated a PPA and capacity payment ongoing with utility and and um, for for 80 megawatts of qualifying facility. Um, slide needs to be updated because uh, PSC, we haven't negotiated anything with you. But we may have to come to you if um, we needed your uh, arbitration. Successfully completed industrial water right scoping exercise with Montana DNRC. Next step is consultation. Secured comprehensive prior met mass data in vicinity of plan wind farm. A wind farm will be supporting uh, green power inputs into the plant. Received blue hydrogen capital equipment estimates from a leading global OEM. That improves our financial model as well as on the green side, but the green hy hydrogen side is optional. And then we've received cost estimates for rail spur, interconnect legal and engineering from top firms. So we're making really good progress. What some of those terms mean? Sure. What does that mean for agreement for offtake of all H2 derived products? Sure. So, so, so just to break that down, um, we have received from high level executive at a major firm, um, the, the, the 
the, a proposal to purchase all of our um, hydrogen derived products, uh, including fertilizer. So what sort of carbon dioxide emissions might be eliminated? Um, 500,000 CO2 tons per year to permanent geological storage. Um, that would be either first party sequestration or first and third party sequestration. Uh, 352,000 CO tons per year due to um, hydrogen being combusted versus say diesel uh, without any sort of hydrogen uh, mix. Uh, 543,000 CO2 tons per year avoided due to renewable power generation total 1.4 million CO tons per year eliminated. There is a bolt-on project potential at coal strip. And if that was the case, it would raise the amount of CO2 eliminated to 9.6 million uh, tons of CO2 per year. So these are some of the communities benefiting from this $1.9 billion project. Um, in red, you see project facilities, Northeast Montana, and then Rosebud County would be a potential project um, that we believe would be a fantastic backup um, to units three and four, um, and, and could, could actually complement units three and four. So it's not necessarily uh, a competition thing. It's simply to provide additional employment security to the workers in Coal Strip. Transitioning coal communities. Um, as you see, we've had a lot of plant closures and whatnot, a lot of communities dependent on coal. Um, and we're not making any sort of judgment about coal. What we are saying is let's give those workers, let's give those communities a little more economic security. They've got a backup plan. Tribal nations would also benefit from this. Um, our, our Northeast Montana plant site would benefit the Sioux and, and uh, Assiniboine and Sioux uh, tribal nations, um, Coal Strip, already is benefiting Northern Cheyenne uh, significantly. That would continue on with our project and be uh, amplified. And then this would also benefit uh, Crow as well. So this is just another way of looking at the communities that would be served. The bottom left chart shows the US Department of Energy's disadvantaged communities map. Um, as you see, the plant is right there. Uh, in, uh, helping a disadvantaged community in Montana. Um, the top right is the White House's energy community map. And again, you see perfect overlap with these types of disadvantaged communities. And then Montana's own general coal impact area map, again, perfect overlap. So this is really getting to uh, um, the heart of helping to the maximum extent the communities that need it most. So this is a process. Um, this is not highly detailed, but it just kind of steps uh, us through what we're proposing. So we're proposing a 200 megawatt wind farm. This actually might be a third party wind farm, but it might be a first party wind farm. The base economic model is that it would be a first party wind farm. We're also that that would go into the grid and then the grid would supply through the clean energy from the wind farm, the plant. It would produce blue hydrogen, blue hydrogen, natural gas based. That blue hydrogen would go into H2 derived products such as fertilizer. It would also go to an H2 pipeline that would potentially be sold for transportation purposes, but there we also have a proprietary uh, internal offtake for up to 38,000 tons of our hydrogen. I can't get into the specifics on that. Um, the H2 pipeline, if we were to size the plant appropriately for coal strip, could supply the entire 1,480 megawatts that units three and four are supplying. Again, doesn't have to happen, could be a smaller share, but it's an excellent economic security backup for the workers in coal strip. So why are we interested in Eastern Montana? Well, other than the fact that Ray and I are, you know, longtime Montanans with, you know, families going back generations, that Eastern Montana has great natural gas supply. It has transcontinental rail and highway. 
it has land and it has wind and it has a world-class river basin. What we consider key ingredients for low carbon, low cost, high volume hydrogen production. So this gives a map of one of our potential sites um, and, and it kind of shows the lay of the land. And in the bottom right, you see pictures of the actual site where the plant will be built. In the bottom left, you see a legend going from top to bottom in red. The star would be plant location um, subject to um, some review. Natural gas pipeline in yellow um, coming into the plant, supplying um, a considerable amount of natural gas. In, in blue, we're looking at a supply and return water pipeline. In green, we're looking at a hydrogen pipeline coming from the plant, the Red Star, across the Missouri River, and then down to I-94, where you would have different mobility offtake, but potentially to coal strip. In um, orange, um, fertilizer would be shipped both east and west via rail and truck. Um, in white, we have the wind farm. Um, that is a particular area. We are also talking to third-party wind farms about an allocation. And then there's 234 kV and 115 uh, kV power lines. Um, they're, they're 115 uh, kV power lines, but with the intention to upgrade. And then the box to the right of the red star are class six wells for carbon sequestration. And then there's an optional CO2 pipeline uh, coming from the Red Star across the Missouri River, um, heading south if we needed to use third-party sequestration. So our base project proposal um, is a low-carbon hydrogen production facility in eastern Montana, a low-carbon USA-made and Montana-made fertilizer plant, associated wind farm, either first or third party, um, supplying green power to the plant, reducing our carbon intensity. Carbon management, um, our CO2 would be embedded in our H2 derived products. Um, we would also have third party sequestration and EOR and or first party sequestration. <clears throat> Built in H2 offtake, we would have a 100 mile hydrogen pipeline to Interstate 94 with optional extension to coal strip co-laid with our CO2 pipeline. And internally, we would have an 80 megawatt qualified facility. Can't get into the details of that, but that is um, inherent in our more detailed presentation and, and, and baseload. So this talks about that 11 May, 2023 EPA report. Um, the e, e News says EPA's 700-page proposal unveiled Thursday is a sweeping crackdown on coal and natural gas emissions with requirements that may force power companies to install carbon capture and storage technology or co-fire with hydrogen. Um, we're not passing any judgment um, on, on energy sources. What we are saying is let's, let's make sure we have a backup plan for our workers. This map also shows where the northeastern Montana hydrogen plant could supply low-cost, low-carbon, high-volume fuel for all sorts of different um, major um, companies, whether it be coal strip, whether it be the multiple refineries and billings, whether it be, as Commissioner Pinochi uh, noted, the Yellowstone Generating Station. Um, we're not saying that Yellowstone Generating Station should be hydrogen, but a mix of hydrogen and natural gas makes sense, especially in light of the EPA's recent report. And importantly, as we've learned from key stakeholders and billings, um, th this project could also help attract uh, companies looking for low carbon, uh, plentiful fuel to Eastern Montana, including billings, if there was this um, offtake of hydrogen produced from Northeastern Montana. Next. So we have multiple discounted cash flow models, financial models. Uh, this is um, blacked out because those are proprietary details, but the projected net investment is $1.9 billion. There are some variations. 
Um, our projected private investment is about 950 million, as well as public investment, 950 million. We would like the state of Montana to consider contributing um, even a small symbolic amount, given the large jobs creation potential and competitiveness potential in Eastern Montana. There are certain discounted cash flow financial model parameters that our model follows. Um, one thing to note is that um, in the last two weeks, we have also been formally recommended for and commenced the U.S. Department of Energy's Title 17 uh, loan program office um, process, and that could supply um, a significant amount of um, preferable debt financing for this project. We would like Montana to also uh, contribute at, at, at a level that makes sense for it. So this is our project timeline. We think we could actually break ground in 2024 if things go according to plan and be commissioned and operational in 2026. And this goes for either the core plan of a Northeastern hydrogen facility that's producing uh, hydrogen and also producing um, fertilizer, but it, it could also be if we upscaled the plant in order to support a hydrogen fired power generation facility for coal strip. So this talks a little bit more about coal strip. And just as a note in the bottom left-hand corner, Cyan was awarded a competitive grant through the US EDA and SEMDC to conduct a hydrogen technical feasibility study for coal strip in Rosebud County. And that deliverable will be um, the 1st of September, 2023. We may be presenting that during the energy open uh, at coal strip uh, during the summer. This basically talks about different coal strip challenges as the, the um, Public Service Commission is very well aware of, um, whether it be, um, you know, the age of units three and four, uh, we're, we're just informed this morning that one unit is completely offline and the other is operating at 18 percent. Um, of course, this may be seasonal, this may be uh, periodic, but we need a backup plan. Um, even if units three and four last till 2042, need a backup plan just to enhance the security uh, of those workers. Um, the 11 May EPA report talking about the need for carbon capture, the need for hydrogen integration, um, another challenge. Um, the owner's balance sheet instability. Talon recently emerged from bankruptcy. You know, apparently it's on good financial footing now, but there are risks out there. And again, we just want to provide a backup plan for coal strip workers. About nuclear, nuclear is an option. I, I'm a nuclear engineer. I was certified by Naval Reactors as a nuclear engineering officer. I've worked firsthand on nuclear plants. I'm not anti-nuclear. I think it has a huge role in our future energy portfolio. But I also think given vision and the waste products nuclear can create, if there's another base load, low carbon solution, we should also look at that. And that's what we're proposing is a base load, low carbon backup plan for coal strip that is an alternative for people's consideration to nuclear. What we're proposing is transformational, but there are examples and analogs. Um, back to Delta, Utah, to the Intermountain Power Project switch from coal to hydrogen. Um, it's projected to power significant rural Utah job growth. The Department of Energy provided a half a billion dollars in funding for this transformation uh, as an example. And th while they are going to be using hydrogen that is wind and solar driven, um, we, we know that they are also going to be using blue hydrogen. Uh, it, that's another thing about blue hydrogen is that if you really want to have a lot of volume of hydrogen, um, blue hydrogen is really important. It, uh, I think a thousand 
a megawatt wind farm in Montana may may only support like 40 or 50,000 tons of hydrogen. So you, you need like a massive footprint to, to, to get um, the output for hydrogen that you want. So again, we're, we're very bullish on blue hydrogen. So we're not just by ourselves. Um, we have 20 organizations who have signed a non-disclosure agreement, so including some of the world's top uh, multinationals. Um, we are the owner, uh, co-owner, manager, and development of the project. Um, but we have top companies, whether it be on the pipeline side, whether it be on the qualifying facility side, carbon management side, feedstock supply and interconnect, the wind farm side, the blue hydrogen side, engineering side, legal finance side, and also tax credit side. So we, we've we've covered most of our bases. We continue to build out our team, though, because we want to make sure that um, all the specialties are are um, represented, and and we can move forward um, with our investors um, confidently. So this is an informational. Um, presentation of the Montana Public Service Commission. Again, we're, we really appreciate the opportunity to let you know uh, what's transpiring. What's, what's transpiring in Eastern Montana, but there's no formal ask at this time. Um, it's just for your and the public's informational purposes. Um, we would ask um, uh, for a letter of support as we are reaching out to different private investors and public investors. Um, part of their evaluation process is a community benefits uh, process. So they want to see if there is support from the community. There's certainly support from the community, but also from major stakeholders like yourselves. Um, so that is something that you know we would be requesting and we'll be requesting from each member of our congressional delegation, as well as Governor Gianforte, uh, different state legislators, um, and 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 you folks, it doesn't mean that you're saying this is, you know, the the best project in the world. This is exact. We fully value it. What it means is that this holds some interesting potential for Montana and and deserves a a um, a true consideration. And then for the public, uh, either online at the moment or those who may. Uh, look at this video uh, moving forward. We, we'd ask you to ask your governor, ask your U.S. senators, ask your U.S. representatives, state legislators, and local officials if and how they are helping this major jobs accretive Eastern Montana project that's of buying for Montanans. And I think that's an important point: is that yes, there may be a multinational that sweeps in from overseas or out of state with a lot of promises, but this is something that's homegrown. And um, we hope that gets some consideration as well. Thank you. That was excellent. Very, very well done. May I ask some more questions? Uh, absolutely. All right. We're obsessed with low carbon hydrogen, as, as you know. All right. It looks like Montana Governor Gian Forte is behind coordinating and developing a regional clean hydrogen hub. So he's, he's I mean, he's officially, I suppose, given the word, but so... Um, Couple well, I have quite a few questions, but I think they'll be pretty quick. Um, methane production when natural gas is used. So you talk about carbon sequestration, but what about the methane? What do you do with that? How are you dealing with that environmental so, issue? Well, well, the so so are you saying like methane leaks or correct? Well, um, for for methane leaks, we're, we're talking about a very short interconnect and pipeline to our plant. So we're, we're talking no leaks, negligible leaks. Um, we're also talking about methane being um, processed in our, in our plant um, and all of the CO2 uh, managed. So now we're, this, this is not a situation where we're, we're transporting methane um, for, you know, thousands of miles or something like that. And there's all of these micro leaks, which can be quite significant. Uh, this is different. Okay. And, and as far as, Hydrogen specific pipelines. Can you use the XL pipelines that aren't being used? Can you use those? Or? As we understand, all the pipeline um, infrastructure has been removed. Um, what we—it's a great question, and and we believe that the pathway 
could be leveraged. The easements, um, all of those landowners and counties that were benefiting from that tax base that the Keystone XL pipeline could have provided, um, there is a potential of intercepting that pathline um, and, and going that route. So um, yes, the pipeline would be different, um, but in, in fact, we may have two pipelines instead of just one pipeline. So it, it would be for Montana, even more jobs accretive. Okay. Um, article that I read, and this was James Osborne of the Washington Bureau, and the title of it was Market Still Hazy Even as Biden Spends Billions. And the basic topic, or what got my attention anyway about it, it says, and here's a quote, it says, I mean, even if everything else was all just dandy, it says a refinery, for instance, would need to spend at least three times as much on clean hydrogen as it does on standard carbon intensive hydrogen, factoring in federal tax incentives. An ammonia plant would need to pay at least twice as much. So this is a fairly recent article in the Washington Bureau with those kind of concerns. And I think a lot still needs to be ironed out. I get that. <laughs> What's the question, ma'am? Um, well, it, even if if some of the other things, it still costs a lot to produce it. Well, I think it's important to to appreciate that, as, as Commissioner Pinochi mentioned, natural gas prices have been very volatile. Um, what we're looking at are long term contracts, so that smooths out a lot of the volatility. Um, the other side of the coin is carbon has a price. And for sure, if you assume that carbon does not have a price um, and that it is not a pollutant, then you could make the argument that carbon intensive models are the way to go. But just like a hundred years ago, when people used to dump pollutants into a lake, there were a lot of people who were like, you know, that's the best, cheapest way to go about things. But 100 years later, we view it differently. And, and I think 100 years from now, people will sort of ask the question, well, you know, CO2 is, is a gas, is a fluid, just like a lot of waste products 100 years ago that were poured into a lake. And, and you know, so let's, let's avoid pouring that CO2 into the atmosphere, which is a fluid, just like a lake. So I think it's kind of a, a shift in, in, in perception. Um, and it really kind of boils down to, do we value, um, do we put a value on, on carbon and do we put a value on the impacts that carbon can, can have? And I think it boils down to cost and utility of hydrogen itself, the way you're proposing it and that pre-combustion carbon capture. Cause I think if it, you know, like you said, Australia, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna look that up, but it, if it was if it was so clean and so efficient, I would think a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't be reading all these articles about the problems with carbon capture. I think they'd be, it'd be utilized around the world if it was if it was all as cracked up to be. So I just, I think many things remain to be seen. And, and so to me, it doesn't just boil down to you know, sunshine and roses and keeping the air clean and the water clean, it, it boils down to the cost and utility of these two things, which from what I've read, and I've read fairly extensively, it's not it's not completely ironed out. Well, I think that's fair. Um, it's not ironed out. But I think what is also fair is that the status quo is untenable. Uh, it's not going well. Um, it's unfair to the workers of Coal Strip. They need a backup plan. They don't have one. Not that I know of. Um, we're presenting a backup plan. And, and does it need to be run to ground? Yes. Are there examples where this is happening? Well, yes. Um, again, probably Delta Utah is the most fantastic analog for what could happen at Coal Strip. Um, and that's what we're proposing, is that there'd be hydrogen-powered turbines uh, producing power at Coal Strip, hiring all those workers and then some. And I think that's that's really that's really important. So I, I agree, but but I would also I would also say that for every article that is skeptical about hydrogen carbon capture, uh, these sort of things, uh, I would say that there are many other articles um, that are very favorable, and um, 
it, and we also need to look outside of the United States. What's happening in, in Asia, uh, including our biggest competitors, um, and what's happening in Europe, um, you know, we, we need to draw from there. And then we also have to look at the U.S. Department of Energy's Office Clean Energy um, Demonstrations Hydrogen Hub Program, and and seeing all of the types of low carbon hydrogen projects that are coming online. So the real question is, does Montana want to compete or do we want to sign a non-compete clause with the rest of the United States and the rest of the world? I say, as a fourth generation Montanan, let's compete. And I'll tell you, we have the ingredients in Montana to be a world leader in hydrogen production. There's no doubt about that. So let's not sign that non-compete clause just yet because our competitors outside of Montana, including just over the border in Wyoming and just over the border in North Dakota, are their, their stakeholders are saying, put those big hydrogen hubs right here. And we need the same sort of advocacy. And I think one of the things about living to an advanced age like I have is that you see you see a lot of models come and go. You know, if the 1970s and 1980s climate change, you know, catastrophe models would come true, United Kingdom would be underwater. We'd be if we weren't dead and burnt to a crisp, we'd be we'd be wearing gas masks. I mean, none of those models came true. And so so I have an issue with with projecting very much because models do not project pro project any very much of anything for the long term. They just don't. I'm very familiar with medical models. I've studied them for 40 years. Information in, information out, it's not always real useful. So that's one of the things. The other thing about living long is that you see things come and go and people get excited about it. And it's a big hype in the press and the government gets on board, you know, provides, you know, millions of dollars, billions of dollars to these things and they don't pan out. So it's part of being an older person is that I see these things come and go. And so that's the basis of my skepticism. You know, your talk is great and theoretically sounds sounds wonderful. But so did, so did algae for power. Yeah, and, and algae for power as, as a role. Um, no, I, I, I agree with you. Like you said, let, you know, time will tell. But again, the current situation is untenable. It's not going well for workers. Um, how many more plants need to close? before we have a backup plan if we're coal strip. So when we talk about risk, we're looking at probability of success and the consequence if something happens. And you know the, the, the consequence over in Eastern Montana is just massive job layoffs. Um, the, the consequence, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of CO2 is you know a more drought, more, more stress on our farmers and ranchers, more fire, forest fires. Um, so let's say, for instance, all of that's wrong. But let's and 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 it could be, it could be, it might be overblown. But the consequence is so significant that you know e even a low probability of that happening needs to be taken seriously. So that's all we're saying is we're presenting um, a a plant that independent from coal strip can can survive and succeed uh, and we would like your uh, support for that but we're also saying that there could be a bolt-on project that provides workers in eastern montana related to coal strip a solid backup plan so they don't one day have to sell their house for pennies on the dollar that's what we're talking about and if there's a solid backup plan then fantastic, but I'm not seeing it. And, and I think there needs to be an alternative to nuclear as a backup plan as well, giving challenges with nuclear. And like I said, backup plans still have to show cost and utility. You know what I mean? For, for backup plan, we can come up with all kinds of things, but it needs to be shown. So it's a, just a... A, absolutely. And, and we need to make sure that our cost analysis is holistic and, and, and not just selective. Yes, I agree. That's excellent. Thank you. I think that's all. I see we have a hand raised from Greg Kometz. Greg, Representative Kometz, can you hear us all right? Representative Kometz, we just can't hear you. Um, Philip, is there a a phone number you could call in on. I see. 
All right. Is there any way you could call in now if you were able to text them a phone number? Or is that a possibility? While you're working on that, I have a couple of questions. Pipelines can be complicated when we have to cross a state line. The pipelines you're proposing will not cross any state lines. Is that correct? They'll be within the borders of Montana. Is that correct? That is correct. That's the base plan. That makes things much more manageable. One of the pipeline um, setbacks was coordinating from state to state to state. And within the state of Montana, we have a great deal of uh, ability to, to get things approved. And the Public Service Commission helps manage pipeline safety. So let's talk a little bit about the energy committees that are within uh, the legislature, Senate Energy, House Energy. I've supplied a book today, and I encourage you guys to give this talk to all the energy committees. He took, I encourage you to uh, do the same presentation to get them up to speed, what your company's about like you've done today. A great start would be to take this uh, YouTube video and send it to each one of them. I encourage them to watch it and then try to schedule a meeting where you could get them up to speed on what, what your guys' plans are. Uh, in the last legislative session, I attended a meeting where the legislature explained to me that they have the ability to use coal trust money for really anything uh, that they have a majority vote for. Some things I heard is, would the money being spent borrowed from the coal trust, which they have like a billion dollars, benefit coal strip? Another question was, would it create jobs? Another question was, could the project that we would help fund pay back into the coal fund? Do you think these three questions you have answers for uh, if that committee was here today? What, do, what sort of answers would you have for those three questions? Commissioner Pinochet, could you rephrase that just a little bit? Well, um, the Coal Trust Fund has like a billion dollars or more. And the legislature, through 51% of the vote, can use that money for whatever they want. Um, so listening to some proposed ideas, they said, there's some criteria we'd like to meet if we were to use Coal Trust money for a project. One, would it benefit Coal Strip? Two, would it create jobs? Um, three, one of the things that were brought up, could, uh, after the company's up and running, contribute into the coal fund? Okay. And those are some things that uh, I thought, wow, I could see some projects meeting that criteria. And th there were a couple other things brought up that I'm not thinking about. But on those three questions, do you think that you could meet that criteria with this plan? Yes, sir. I think we can. We're, we're looking at conservatively a thousand plus construction period jobs, um, 300 plus if the coal strip option was invoked, potentially double that uh, post construction jobs indefinitely handed over family generation after generation. Um, this would this would certainly benefit coal strip. Uh, it would benefit all Eastern Montana. Um, and I think a creative solution where once up and running cash flow is being generated, um, basically paying back or potentially even with a return to the investment that was made. I, I, I think some sort of creative participation in the capital structure from the state of Montana side, whether it be the coal trust fund, as you've mentioned, whether it be Montana Board of Investments, whether it be directly from the state legislature, um, you know, we're, we're open to all sorts of creative thinking. And but yeah, we appreciate you mentioning that uh, it's it's a good idea. And I think we would satisfy those three criteria for um, a coal trust fund investment. I certainly would encourage getting with representatives like Greg Kometz, and I sure apologize he's not able to communicate with us today. Uh, but Jason Small and others in that community uh, try to organize a meeting, which I'd be happy to sit in on, uh, for them to consider um, this proposed plan and understand you might meet that criteria. 
And if the legislature was to vote on that and more than half of the vote would go that way, that there's funding available. So let's talk a little bit about. And, and if I may, you know, we want to make sure that this is private sector focused and business focused. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, that's our focus, um, making sure that we have a retained investment bank. I'm talking to different private equity and infrastructure funds, talking to pension funds, talking to asset managers. So we're, we want to make sure that this works out. Um, right now, our model shows that without any public assistance, um, only private business assistance, this model works out. That said, a, filling out a capital structure can be greatly benefited and turbocharged by public investment, just like you're talking about coal trust fund, other sources, a Department of Energy at the federal level, which sends a positive signal to the private sector as well, and vice versa. And, and then ultimately you have your capital structure achieved. So um, we are focused on the private sector and the business side. Uh, the, the model works without um, public assistance, but Public assistance, we believe, will be critical to um, galvanizing the private sector in joining the capital structure. Representative Kometz and I uh, were in several conversations, and I was listening to him very carefully, and he has uh, some ideas um, of trying to bring coal strip units one and two back online. Uh, there's an article there shows a new design of a turbine that is 66% more efficient than any turbine we have uh, generating power today. They say it's ready for construction now. Uh, I sit on the National Board of Coal, and I took a tour at a uh, high-secure Air Force base in Texas, where, oddly enough, they brought in um, the coal board members for the National Coal Council of Nehru, where we were able to uh, get into a large facility on the Air Force Base, and they're testing the most efficient turbine, they say, built in the world. And it was um, basically top secret. Um, but they explained to us that we could talk about it. Uh, we couldn't take any pictures. and. Uh, Kometz and I are wondering if we were to put a turbine like this, these new high efficiency turbines in place of units one and two and run them on say hydrogen, the transmission lines are already in place, uh, which that cost to Washington exceeds a billion dollars alone. The transmission lines can be doubled in capacity by upgrading them to the new high efficiency power line, which cuts the line loss by one third, which is millions of dollars in savings each year. The new power lines would pay for themselves in five years, according to one of the leading power line or high performance conductor manufacturers. Uh, he's very excited about getting units one and two back on. Uh, and I, I think that was one of the questions he wanted to ask today, and I sure encouraged him to. Uh, what are your thoughts to this idea that Greg, Representative Kometz has? Um, do you think that uh, there could be some merit here? And then, of course, if there is, the Coal Trust Fund would certainly um, be up for, for a vote uh, between the Senate and the House to say, well, if we can get Units 1 and 2 back on. Keep in mind, I also sit on the National Board of Electricity. And they say we have a shortage in the Western United States of power. To bring two major units back online would be healthy for Montana and the Western United States. What are your thoughts there with um, this discussion I had with Representative Kamins? Representative Kamins's idea is solid. It, it definitely deserves a hard look. And, and I... I don't think that's a political uh, assessment. I think whether you're Republican or independent or Democrat, 
looking at a way to do low carbon base load power at coal strip, leveraging units one and two, if possible, is a solid idea. It needs to be looked at. And we have considered that exact idea. In meetings I've had in Washington, D.C. and other areas with Nehru considering a shortage on energy in the Western United States, one of the answers were bringing coal plants that were shut down back online. If we could do so in a cleaner fashion with lower carbon emissions, uh, there are two major arguments to coal. Number one, the coal ash piles up and can be toxic and poison groundwater, which a bill was introduced by Jerry, Representative Jerry Scherlinger this year that said if coal ash could be used in the mixture of concrete or road construction for the same cost or less than burying it, which we are burying coal ash right now at a cost at about 400 million. And I believe it'll exceed 500 million because it'll take years to do. And as inflation goes up, the cost will increase. If we're able to use uh, coal ash in the production of concrete and road construction, we'll take one of those arguments away. We get out a future liability where we may have to move the coal ash in the future. Oddly enough, that bill was killed and I wanna aggressively go after that in the next session. Uh, argument number two is a carbon emission from a coal plant. And of course, if we could run that on hydrogen, there would be no carbon emission. <laughs> okay. So we'd in fact have a green coal facility answering these questions. So um, I think in the next session, I, I want to help work on that some more. But um, Representative Kmetz, I know, had some questions along this line, and I'm trying to cover that uh, because I'm sure he would say, why the heck didn't you say that if I couldn't talk? So I encourage uh, another meeting and I'm sure Greg will be there. He sits on uh, the energy committee, okay? And uh, um, I uh, would hope that you guys would reach out for that. Um, do you guys have any questions for any of the commissioners? Well, I'd just like to thank you, um, both of you and the commission in general for the opportunity to talk about this project. We think it's important for Montana. Western Montana has been doing pretty well. Missoula, Bozeman, juggernauts. But there's also this Eastern Montana piece. And, and I grew up in part in Eastern Montana as a kid. And Ray is from Eastern Montana, born and raised. So, you know, there's a business case, there's an energy case, there's a national security case here, but there's also, you know, we would like to see Eastern Montana thrive as well. And, and, and um, with your support and the support of other major stakeholders in the state of Montana, I think we get it done. So thank you again for your time. Well, and furthermore, me and I sit on the National Board of Coal and Electricity. I have a responsibility not only to look out for the security of energy for Montana, but the whole United States. Um, so perhaps what we could do is uh, try to get you guys to speak at a NARUC event, um, maybe a Western Conference energy uh, event where they talk about filling the energy needs of the Western United States. So it's my belief that Montana could be an energy exporting state instead of an energy importing state, which then you'd be helping the security of the United States outside of the Montana borders. And again, I encourage any company that has ideas to expand energy in Montana to come to this commission and go over the game plan. And thank you for doing that. With that, um, I'll end this hearing. Thank you.